Dr. Schmid earned her PhD from the University of Washington. Uh, she combines experimental biology with computational biology, as many of us here in the department also seek to do. Outside of the lab, Dr. Schmid brings the joys of science and learning bioinformatics to students and teachers within her own community. Um, and today she'll be talking to us about the way in which gene networks and in extremophiles respond to the environment. Great. Thank you so much, Darby, um, for the invitation, for the introduction. I'm really excited to um, be at this mini symposium. I really am impressed in the way that you all um, took the organization to the virtual space so seamlessly and quickly. And um, I'm excited in this venue to share with you um, our work on uh, microbial extremophiles. Um, so I'll start my screen share now um, to pull up my slides. And um, in, um, in our work, um, I'd, I'm excited to share with you what we've discovered about unconventional model microbes in hypersaline environments. And as you can see here on the title slide, this is um, a hypersaline salt evaporation pond in the San Francisco Bay. And the purple color comes from hypersaline archaea um, that require saturated salt for growth. And they will be the focus of, they're the focus of the work in my lab, and they'll be fo the focus of, of my talk today. So when many people think of biological resilience, um, public uh, sort of knowledge comes to ideas of water bears, for example, shown on the right here, which can be, are known to be desiccated for up to five years with no water. They've lived in space. Um, they've been on the, um, in, uh, in, in space shuttles. People also think of, of maybe cockroaches as, as pretty resilient. Um, but I'd like to introduce to you today something that has captured my imagination and has fascinated me um, in my research for years, and that's this seemingly um, unassuming microbe that's growing and dividing um, uh, in the middle, as you can see here in this video that we, that we made recently. But what's really remarkable here is that it's doing all of this in saturated salt medium. And um, in order to grow this way, they've, um, these, these archaea take the salt into their cytoplasm, and this has required evolutionary adaptations such as um, a hyper, um, a extremely acidic proteome changes to um, the, the amino acids in their proteome to um, stay soluble in light of this saturated cytoplasm. But um, what is really less known is how these microbes respond dynamically to their environment. And in hypersaline ecosystems, such as an aerial view of the Great Salt Lake shown here, um, in the northern arm of the Great Salt Lake, which is all pink in this image, um, has become hypersalinated when the, a railroad causeway um, was bise bisected the lake built in the 1950s to bring cargo across the lake. And in this hypersaline environment, it's closed from its outflow and inflow. And so it's uh, um, been subject to desiccation and rehydration cycles over the course um, of, of the seasons. And so um, these desiccation rehydration cycles really present um, a dynamic and fluctuating um, stress environment for these halo archaea or hypersaline adapted archaea and that in this, in this ecosystem. And so the questions that we ask in my lab have really to do with resilience during these extreme fluctuations um, in environmental conditions. And as you can see here um, on this aerial image of a salt flat, these microbes can um, become trapped in salt crystals, but they, survive. they not only survive, they can live there um, and trapped in these, in these um, crystals for 200 and up to 250 million years and then be resuscitated um, and continue to grow in the lab after that. Um, so we um, in my lab are just really fascinated by these stress response um, capabilities of these microbes. And um, we'd really like to understand this um, as a sort of an extreme model system 
for biological resilience um, in, in a dynamic setting. And as I mentioned before, um, these halo archaea are representatives of the domain archaea as shown on this tree of life. And um, in keeping with the theme of this symposium, um, there's really a, a huge percentage of the tree of life that we know virtually nothing about. And um, as every time you know, there are environmental sampling studies, um, lots and lots of new species um, and taxa are discovered. Um, and as you can see on this um, tree of life here, recent discoveries such as the Osgard superphylum of Archaea, these are the closest relatives now known to the last um, eukaryotic common ancestor. And this, this, these discoveries have completely redrawn the tree of life over the last couple of years, where um, we now think there are only two domains of life, the archaea and the bacteria, and eukaryotes then stem from the archaea. So in a sense, we are all, as we are, uh, you, we humans are eukaryotes, we are all stemming from archaea. And so in studying these unconventional model organisms of archaea, we can really learn something about, um, about our, our history, our evolutionary history. And in my lab, we use um, a network approach um, in these um, archaeal model systems um, to predict how um, organisms might uh, be resilient to stress over time in dynamic settings. And so this is um, sort of our own unique um, approach to address these questions um, in um, in that are central to systems biology. So looking at um, in response to environmental conditions, we are in the business of building um, molecular networks um, from genomics data. And from those networks, um, look, predicting how these um, changes in levels, numbers of molecules over time may enable us to make predictions about the phenotypic outcome. So this is sort of our take on the genotype to phenotype relationships with the goal in mind of predicting the phenotypic response to, um, to stress in the environment. And so just to take a moment um, to motivate this idea of network biology, um, and I like to use this example um, shown here as, from my Facebook network. So I, I downloaded all of my contacts from Facebook and these, um, these lines here, the yellow lines represent cross posts or likes on each other's walls and the dots or nodes represent people. And the central node here is me. And um, what the, there are a few things that really jump out right at first that I think really nicely highlight some attributes that we can learn about biological networks as well. And so first you can see that there are sort of two major clusters, one on the left and one on the right. The cluster on the left represents those people who um, I ride bicycles with and the ones on the right um, represent those people who I play ultimate Frisbee with. And so these are, um, um, ideas of guilt by association. So for example, if there was a, somebody on the periphery over here and you didn't know them, you, you could say something about them. They ride bikes because they're in the bicycle cluster of people. Um, so this guilt by association can also be used in, in gene networks to try to understand the function of unknown genes, which is a huge problem, as many of you know, in, in studying unconventional model organisms. And one other important aspect of this is sort of the, the hub and spoke idea of a network. So there's, for example, in the center of the two clusters here, there is a person who I knew rode bikes, but I didn't know that he also played ultimate Frisbee. So I could just ask one person when the next group bike ride was and when the next pickup ultimate Frisbee game was. And so um, this, in a gene network sense, this this node here in the middle could be considered a hub um, or a central regulator, for example. And um, so, the, so networks in general can really teach us um, very quickly about the attributes of networks can um, teach us about gene function and also about um, how um, uh, different uh, regulators in the network um, are related to each other. 
And so, um, as I mentioned in, in my lab, we're interested in focusing on gene regulatory networks. Um, and we, we see this as really um, central to the response to stress. Um, because um, as signals come in from the environment, these signals are detected by um, regulatory cascades. Um, and in archaea, um, directly, these signals are directly sensed by the transcription factors, which then bind to DNA and either um, activate transcription by enabling recruitment of RNA polymerase or impeding um, the recruitment of RNA polymerase through repression. And um, these um, gene regulatory networks can be re represented in these um, ball and stick diagrams, which I'll be showing periodically throughout the talk to represent activation arrows or repression, um, repression relationships between transcription factors and their target genes. And in archaea, um, transcription, archaea are a really great model for transcription regulatory networks for two reasons. One is that, as I mentioned before, um, the transcription factors um, are like those that activate and repress transcription, resemble those um, in bacteria, and can bind directly to an environmental signal to activate or repress transcription. This really simplifies the gene regulatory network um, problem. Uh, unraveling gene regulatory network functions. Secondly, um, the uh, um, Tata binding protein and TF2B homologs um, that are required for initiation of transcription and recruiting of RNA polymerase resemble those of eukaryotes. And so you can learn something about all three domains of all, all of the domains of life by studying transcriptional networks in archaea, as well as understanding how signals are integrated from the environment to deploy the appropriate response. And so we take um, a comparative approach in um, halophilic archaea um, to understand environmental stress response. Um, and in particular, um, we study these four model organisms shown here, uh, the representative of the known um, phylogenetic diversity of hypersaline archaea. We now have 80 species that have genome sequences available. Um, and so we can, we have a really powerful system um, to do comparative genomics and comparative network biology. Um, and uh, we're also interested in these questions of how these, how these networks evolve. And so this um, comparative approach can help with that. Um, these microbes, these model systems um, are adapted to gradients of stress. So we can compare across different levels of stress and how networks adapt um, to, the, to that differential selection. These have small circular genomes around two to four megabases. So this, in a, this really aids high throughput genomics. For example, in our recent ChIP-seq experiments, we've been multiplexing 96 samples per lane. Um, so we can really generate a, lot, a large a volume of data in a short time frame. And the genomes are, are organized into operons. Um, and so these transcriptional units, um, we can sort of learn um, uh, about gene functions through studying operons as well. Um, and so these are shown here. Um, they also grow relatively quickly. These are the only um, set of archaea that are closely related to each other that are um, um, experimentally tractable. So this is a really great, powerful system for studying, um, studying gene regulatory networks in archaea. And so to get started um, uh, early on in, in this work, about 15 years ago, there were only um, uh, two or three transcription factors that we knew anything about in hypersaline archaea. And so what we decided to do was just to take a top-down approach and study all the transcription factors at once. And so we subjected um, halobacterium, in this case, um, the model system, uh, the model organism shown here in the picture, and we subjected it to pretty much every stress we could think of that was relevant to the hypersaline environment over both dosages and time courses of stress. And then we collected RNA and transcriptomics data, at that time microarray, and now with sequencing approaches. And, and then we re that resulted in a very large transcriptomic data set and also now ChIP-seq data sets where we have on the order of 1,500 um, uh, transcriptome profiles across a wide array of these stress conditions for a small genome of about 2,400 genes. 
And then using statistical approaches, um, we uh, were able to generate these, this predictive gene regulatory network um, where transcription factors are predicted to either activate or repress um, uh, subsets of co-regulated genes that have common cis regulatory sequence predictions as well as common functions, which are shown by these boxes A and B. And so now we can use this hypothesis generation machine to try to understand how archaeal networks are structured, um, what, the, what the function of these transcription factors are. And this network, although it's highly predictive of transcriptional behavior in new environments, it really doesn't tell us much about the physiology itself. So for example, are just because genes are going up and down, um, are, these, um, are these changes in gene expression ultimately resulting in a change in physiology? And so that's one of the questions that we're using the network to ask. Um, so probing the network um, to look at the physiology of cells um, in these environments. Also, although the network makes these nice predictions about influences of potential influences of transcription factors over target genes, it's unclear whether these are direct relationships with the transcription factor binding to its target gene um, uh, promoters. And lastly, this is a global gene regulatory network prediction for one species. Um, how do these networks change when we compare across related species and how do these networks evolve um, during uh, extreme stress selection. And so these are really the central research questions that we address in my lab. And I'll be um, sort of tackling a couple of them today um, as I focus on a particular discovery that we've made recently um, using an approach where um, we've developed a pipeline um, to test the hypothesis, hypotheses from this network starting with knocking out transcription factors and looking in high throughput phenotypes, including growth and cell morphology using microscopy methods. And then we conduct transcriptomics to look at how gene expression changes in the knockouts of the transcription factors. We look at direct transcription factor DNA binding across the genome. And then we integrate the data um, and to understand um, really how, how, the, how the network is structured and how it's functioning in response to stress. And then we conduct um, molecular biology validations of that network. And so using this pipeline, this has taken us into some um, really exciting areas. Um, we've found um, a complex networks that regularly response to metal homeostasis, um, heavy metal contamination, is, a, is um, a factor in, 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 in causes oxidative stress in these hypersaline environments. Um, we've, we've looked um, a lot at cell shape, cell division, and central metabolism, um, which I'll be focusing on today um, with the cell division, and also looked at extreme oxidative stress, and we've discovered some um, new transcription factors in this area. And so I'll start with looking at um, what we've found about oxidative stress resistance. So there's a, um, a transcription factor, which we now call reactive oxygen species regulator that we discovered that binds to DNA um, to regulate transcription in response to extreme oxidative stress. And to put this into context, hypersaline archaea can withstand about an order of magnitude higher oxidative stress than say a mesophilic bacterium like E. coli, for example. And so ros -R is a transcription factor that's unique to hypersaline adapted archaea. So we decided to study it um, because it had a really strong prediction from the network for regulating genes um, involved in oxidative stress, but also because we thought it might be um, a way to adapt um, to these uh, hypersaline, um, extreme oxidative stress in hypersaline environments. And what, to our surprise, we found that in addition to um, what we expected where ROSR was regulating genes that detoxify oxidative stress, ROSR also regulated um, um, a general transcription factor um, that helps to recruit RNA polymerase um, to the pre-initiation complex at transcription initiation. In return, um, TFB, shown in red here, um, feeds back to regulate ROSR, and then together they regulate a subset of 20 other transcription factors. So this is a really highly interconnected 
transcription factor transcription factor network um, that's uh, required for oxidative stress survival. In turn, there are several other general transcription factors that coordinately regulate these other downstream transcription factors. So this is a hierarchical network with an extensive feedback. And this, this extent of um, intercoordination of transcription factors is very surprising for um, a simplified model organism like archaea. For example, in bacteria, um, it's known that only a few transcription factors regulate various genes in response to oxidative stress. And they auto, although they auto-regulate themselves, they don't regulate each other like here in this extensive network. And so um, the next question was, well, what are these other transcription factors doing? There are 20 of them and they're being regulated in response to oxidative stress. But we don't, we didn't know anything about, um, about these downstream transcription factors. So we went through our pipeline and have been systematically knocking these out and looking at um, phenotypes. And I'd like to share our results um, and discoveries about one of them, um, which used to be called um, VNG0194H, which we've renamed as um, CDRS for um, cell division regulator short. So it's a very short protein on the order of about 100 amino acids. And um, if you look um, in just in the genome, it is in a predicted operon with a gene encoding a tubulin homolog, which is thought to be involved in, which is known to be involved in um, cell division in bacteria. And upstream, there was another putative regulator called CDRL, um, cell division regulator long. And interestingly, in the large um, transcriptome profile, the large set of transcriptome profiles, FITZ and CDRS are co-transcribed across nearly every condition. And so we thought this was a really interesting thing to follow up to see what CDRS is doing um, in terms of uh, uh, regulating um, transcription. In addition, CDRS and CDRL each have a short ribbon helix helix domain, which is known to be involved in, um, in uh, binding DNA and um, regulating transcription um, in bacteria. Um, but this is a really unusual um, DNA binding domain type, and that's another reason why we wanted to follow up on this particular transcription factor, putative transcription factor. And as I mentioned, um, FITZ is a tubulin homolog that no, is known to drive cell division in bacteria. It forms the cytokinetic ring and um, divides, uh, for example, in E. coli, divide, divides cells in half during binary fission. In archaea, um, in archaea, uh, there are several, especially halophilic archaea, there are several copies of these uh, FITZ type tubulin homologs present in the genome. And um, some uh, are, uh, resemble those um, forming the cytokinetic ring in bacteria. And there are two, two of these homologs in halophilic archaea. And FITZ2 was the one I was showing on the previous slide um, that's in the same operon as uh, CDRS. In contrast, there's a whole nother class of tubulin homologs in haloarchaea and related taxa that are thought to be involved in cell shape. And these are called this, the newly discovered SETZ family of, of proteins. And so we thought um, this was a good place to follow up. We made knockout mutants according to our pipeline and found that unlike wild type cells, which are normally rod shaped um, and about five microns long, CDRS knockouts are much longer. They're, um, uh, there's a skewed distribution in their cell, uh, cell area um, and they can get up to 80 to 100 microns long. FITZ2 knockouts phenocopy this and are also long and thin. But what we didn't know at this point was even though this is um, comparable to a filamentous classical cell division block in bacteria, FITZ mutants, um, we didn't know at this point whether this was a cell division defect per se, a problem in cell growth or elongation or a problem in, in um, cell shape or morphology or all three. And so we decided to develop time-lapse um, live imaging microscopy um, but we didn't know how wild type cells grew and divided. And so we needed to make some sort of quantitative um, 
uh, conclusions about how wild type grows in order to understand how the CDRS knockout and the FITZ knockout um, were impaired for cell division. And so um, we developed um, these agarose chambers, which you're seeing a movie of here, um, to grow um, these cells unperturbed for up to six generations. Um, and, and the time counter is shown in hours. So these, these are really relatively long time-lapse experiments. And we found that like in bacteria, um, wild type cells of archaea grow and divide in the middle. Um, so the division ratio of the length of the mother to the daughter is about 0.5, so it divides in half. Um, but there is a lot of variance in the archaeal division um, in terms of the cell division placement, as you're seeing here, there's a larger standard deviation in the site, division site placement. The time between divisions is longer or more variable. And um, the, uh, the um, exponential generation time is also more variable. And so we, we developed a physical model and can quantify these different cell division and cell cycle parameters in wild type archaea now. So then we were able to go back and ask, how is the CDRS and FITZ, how are these knockouts perturbed in terms of cell division? But um, lo and behold, when we grow CDRS, it's too long for our square agarose chambers. Um, and so we had to go back to the drawing board, even though it took us a couple of years to figure out how to make those agarose chambers without getting salt crystals in our microscope. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and thought, well, let's try to adapt what's called the mother machine, a microfluidic device that was originally built for bacteria. And what you're seeing here is a time-lapse movie of E. coli growing in a mother machine. And each one of these channels is seeded with a single cell, a mother cell, and it grows out of the channel um, and there's fluid flow across the top of the device. And so you can track for multiple generations what's happening um, in real time um, in, these, in these cells that are growing and dividing. Now, when we put CDRS knockouts in the mother machine, um, it just keeps growing and growing and growing unconstrained by the chamber. Um, and this is uh, unusual. Some, most of them sort of break off when they get to the top of the channel, but you get the idea that this um, is appropriate for looking at the growth of CDRS knockouts. And um, so we added on top of this a visualization of the Z1 cytokinetic ring so that we could really pinpoint where division events were occurring. And on the left hand uh, movie, you're looking at the wild type or parent strain cells growing and dividing. And we can see um, several generations of growth in the parent. Now in CDRS knockouts, um, occasionally they will divide as shown on here on the left. But sometimes they don't divide. And what's interesting is that um, FITZ1 uh, FIT, uh, FIT cytokinetic rings sometimes form, but then dissipate, and then the cell never divides. And so CDRS knockouts are perturbed for cell division um, because only 30%, approximately 30% of cells um, end up dividing. FITZ2 knockouts, on the other hand, were never observed to divide in our uh, microfluidic setup during the experiments. And um, the cytokinetic ring is, doesn't really form uh, effectively. It's, um, the Z1 staining is, is diffused throughout the, throughout the cell. And so we conclude here that CDRS and FITZ2 are required for normal cell division, but as you'll notice, they're growing normally, they're elongating normally. And we can quantify this and show that these um, mutants are um, not required for elongation but they divide off center. So CDRS knockouts divide um, off center and also toward the pole. So they're impaired for the placement of cell division. And the cells are also typically longer at, um, at cell, their larger cell size at division. And so um, again, we think that CDRS and FITZ2 are required for cell division. And we think in particular that, that they're required for um, triggering cytokinesis. And um, then we wanted to ask whether CDRS is involved in regulating cell division, as, as, uh, gene expression. And so we, we looked at a panel of genes um, that are involved, we think are involved in cell division and cell growth. And although FITZ1 is not required, um, CDRS is not required for gene expression of FITZ1, as shown here, 
CRS knockout cells are shown in blue here. So gene expression of FITZ2 is lower in the CDRS knockout um, at early log um, phase of growth. So early in growth during the transition from stasis um, to, cell, to active growth, um, CDRS is required to activate FITZ2 and other genes that are involved in cell, um, thought to be involved in cell growth and cell morphology, such as this one of the set Z genes that I mentioned earlier, as well as a gene that's in um, the par DNA partitioning um, homologue. So we think CDRS is an activator of genes involved in cell division and cell growth. And interestingly, we found also using CHIP-seq experiments that CDRL binds at a single location in the genome, which you can see here, this is the whole genome shown um, in the CHIP-seq profile, and there's one binding site there. And um, if you zoom in, you can see that it's in CDRL binds in front of the CDRS FITC2 operon. So it is highly specific to regulating this, this, um, this operon. And so then we wanted to ask now, now that we know um, we've discovered a key regulator um, of cell division and cytokinesis, and then this regulator is in turn regulated by the oxidative stress response network, is this unusual or unique to this particular model organism that we were looking at, or um, how general is, is CDRS, this, this novel um, transcription factor? And we found that across archaea, the CDRS FITC2 locus is conserved in nearly every known um, uh, major group of archaea, except for these deeply branching um, set of DPAN archaea. Um, and interestingly, CDRL is unique to the halo archaea, suggesting that it's um, sort of an evolutionary innovation and, and is an example of network rewiring, perhaps. And, and to test whether um, the function is conserved as well, um, we conducted overexpression experiments of CDRS in two related species of halophiles that we study in the lab. And we can see that compared to the vector control, CDRS is indeed required for, um, for cell, uh, normal cell division and cell shape in in those related species, suggesting that CDRS is function is also conserved um, across these species. So in conclude, in sort of to sum up, we've discovered um, the sort of simple and specific gene regulatory network regulating cell division, where CDRL regulates CDRS and FITC2, and then CDRS in turn activates FITC2 and other cell division genes. And I wanted to um, talk now about sort of the implications of this study. Um, very recently, um, these Osgard archaea that I mentioned earlier that are sort of the um, closest relative to the last eukaryotic common ancestor, they um, have been brought into culture after 12 years of, of trying by this um, very uh, um, sort of this, after a long um, and hard effort of getting them in culture. And um, as you can see, there are these long membrane projections that are thought to enable entrapment and engulfment of bacteria that could have become, um, eventually become the mitochondrion during the, in, after the endosymbiotic event. But um, what's really still unclear about eukaryogenesis is the cell biology of archaea. And so we're starting to make inroads with these discoveries of these regulatory events um, with a function, for example, of FITZ. And um, as you can see in this diagram here, FITZ is um, conserved in Osgard archaea as well as CDRS. And so we have the capability now to look at mechanisms for eukaryogenesis and endosymbiosis, which we're excited about in the future. In addition, this work has implications for um, the evolution of gene regulatory networks. For example, um, the gain of CDRL in halophiles, which are subject to these extreme and, and fluctuating environmental conditions, perhaps the network complexity is sort of increasing with increasing levels of stress. And this is a theme that we've seen in other work that we've done in my lab, for example, in response to fluctuating iron concentrations, um, there's um, a very complex network in one organism that lives in the water, in sort of the hypersaline um, surface waters 
that sees a lot of changes in iron concentration. Whereas in a related species that lives underneath of the brine layer in the mud, which has a more constant iron environment, has a much less complex network with fewer edges connecting um, fewer transcription factors. And so we're starting to form the hypothesis, the hypothesis now that perhaps network complexity is, is um, chorus corresponds with environmental variability or levels of stress in the environment. And so that concludes my talk and um, thank you for your attention. I'd like to in particular thank um, Cindy Darnell who did the majority of the work for the CDRL, CDRS um, uh, were, um, study um, and also to our collaborators in the Garner and Bisson labs um, and the Amir lab who worked with us on um, the time-lapse microscopy experiments. And I am looking forward to discussing with you and taking questions that you might have. Thanks, Amy. Um, so there's a few questions in our Q&A box. Um, Diane asked, do Archaea have ubiquitin or sumo? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, they actually have um, a different kind of protein modifier called SAMP. Um, small archaeal modifier protein. And SAMP um, is attached like ubiquitin, um, but it has, and it has some um, E1, E2 like enzymes that put you, the, these SAMPs on. Um, but the, um, uh, the identity of a couple of those proteins are still unknown. And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting system from an um, evolutionary standpoint because it's unique to archaea but it's sort of a functional analogy to ubiquitin because the SAMPs um, deliver proteins to the proteasome, which is like uh, eukaryotes. That's the work of Julie Malpen Furlow, a colleague of mine at University of Florida. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so Larry asked, are there any particular binding agents that are stronger or more stable than others? And if so, why? Um, binding agents to the transcription factors, I think. I think Maybe. so. I yeah, think okay. So. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so every um, ligand has a particular affinity um, to, to the transcription factors, and um, this really regulates whether that transcription factor is going to bind DNA or not. And um, um, some transcription factors have different ligands that can bind with different affinities, and that can direct um, the transcription factors to different promoters depending on what, what ligand there is bound. And so this is the work of back, people who work on bacterial transcription factors as well. Um, so for example, um, there's um, an iron regulator in bacteria that, that has um, an iron sulfur cluster. And if that falls out, then it regulates certain genes. But if, um, but if other ligands come and bind to it, it, re it um, regulates other genes. So I, it, I think the answer is yes, there are different affinities and, and different um, ligands that can bind to direct um, DNA binding. Awesome. Um, so John Sittman asked, is there any insight into how archaea sense, uptake, or store iron? And is it similar to our understanding in probes and ukes? Yeah, good question. So um, with the iron work, um, I would answer that in a couple of ways. One is that um, um, the iron transporters at, at the cell surface, we know that there are siderophore transporters that are really similar to those. Um, siderophores are really strong, tight binders of iron in the environment. Um, and those siderophores are taken up by um, transporters that are similar to those of bacteria. In terms of storage, there's a protein called DPS um, that binds iron and the structure of DPS has been solved and um, uh, our halo archaea DPS can bind more iron atoms than a bacterial DPS. So the iron storage capability is also really good and really high in, in hypersaline archaea. Um, how that storage comes into play with the gene regulation is still an open question because iron trafficking in general is really um, really an open area of study still um, in bacteria as well as archaea. Um, so we had a question from Devaki, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, are these genomes stable or are there a lot of horizontal gene transfer events? And do you have any comments on the pan genome giving insights on networks? 
Yeah, I love that question. So we just published a paper a couple of years ago um, where we took all of our large um, transcriptomic data sets and chip chip data sets and, um, and, and did sort of a, um, uh, a take on a segmentation analysis where we looked at areas of copy number variation and found that indeed there were hot spots of copy number variation, either amplification or deletion events at certain sets of genes. And so for example, the B12 biosynthesis cluster um, is rapidly deleted when, when you're when growing, for example, um, in the presence of B12. And so um, there are a lot of um, these hotspots um, are statistically um, overlapping with mobile genetic elements um, that are sort of viral remnants. And viruses, um, you know, are really um, an issue for halo halophilic archaea um, in terms of survival and, and defense um, in these environments. And so um, the genomes are, are highly dynamic, highly plastic. Um, for example, there's one locus that has a 10 to the minus third um, background uh, mutation rate. Um, so there are hot spots in the genome. And yes, horizontal gene transfer happens a lot as well. Um, and so there's really um, um, sort of a lot of uh, dynamics going on in terms of the rewiring in the gene regulatory networks. And that's an area that we're really excited about moving forward. Awesome. Um, so I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, one question is from John Hellman is, is FITZ essential? Do cells that don't divide with FITZ just break? No, FITZ is not essential. Um, so FITZ2 is not essential. We can knock it out and we've done whole genome resequencing um, and there are no suppressors. There are no, um, you know, single copies of the, of the gene hanging out. So we know it's a clean deletion and we know we can knock it out. The cells still elongate at the, at the same rate as wild type, but they just, we just never observe them to divide. Um, we uh, have not um, made uh, knockouts in FITZ1. We've tried and we're still trying. We're not sure yet if FITZ1 is also essential, but we know FITZ2 is not. Cool. Um, so Sue asked, are there archaeal biosynthetic gene clusters that are similar to bacteria and are any of them involved in surviving under extreme environments? Biosynthetic gene clusters involved in surviving in extreme environments. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. Um, trying to think of the best way to answer that question. So one, one way I might answer is that um, there are some cofactor biosynthetic um, gene clusters. So for example, like vitamin B12 biosynthesis, and those cofactors are required for say nutrient um, use and um, an acquisition. Um, but what's interesting is that um, we have a, another part of the lab that studies metabolism. There are a lot of um, sort of unique genes embedded in these biosynthetic clusters that are uniquely archaeal um, within a sort of more bacterial looking um, gene cluster. Like those genes will resemble those of bacteria, but there will be sort of a homologous replacement during the course of evolution within that gene cluster with an archaeal specific gene. And so um, speaking of guilt by association, even though it's a gene of unknown function, if it's within a large cluster of genes that we can guess at the function, that, that's um, one example, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I address that question or not. But. Uh, Jocelyn DiRogerio asks, great, she one commented, great talk, and then two oh, asks, have you done ChIP-seq with CDRL, and if yes, do you know where it binds? With CDRL, yes, and CDRL binds only upstream of the CDRS FITC operon. We've tried CDRS um, uh, chip seq as well. Um, and we, there are technical issues there because the, the, the protein is so short that it's hard to tag. We use an epitope tagging system for chip seq, and CDRS is hard to tag. There is um, another group um, that's studying CDRS, and they have managed to get chip seq working. Um, and I'll let their study come out soon. <laughs> <laughs>